I'm going to introduce first. <laughs> so okay. let's have the last talk of this session from by David Sander and Laura Ditz. Exam, how to evaluate, retrieve, and generate systems for users who do not yet know what they want. Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and I want to give a quick shout out that, that this work would not have been possible without um, other students in my lab at University of New Hampshire and participants that participated in my track, which I'm going to talk more about in this talk. Um, I want to, I mean, I understand that this title is a little bit of a mouthful. I want to focus on this last piece here for, for, for a moment. So in some ways, like this whole work, um, and those who know me probably have heard my spiel about this again, that this work is sort of like motivated by random encounters I had with my friends. And if you have friends like me, then occasionally, um, you find yourself as like depicted up here in the top right corner, standing around with your friends and one is a physicist and says, we physicists talk a big game about the theory of everything, but the truth is we don't really understand why ice skates work. And at this point, everybody's like, what do you mean we don't know how ice skates work? We know that they do work and we know it's something about like ice and melting under compression and, you know, gliding and so on. So what are the things we know, what are the things we do not know, and why do, not, why do we not know these kind of things? Okay, so here we are in a situation where we have a very innocent question like why ice skates work. We have users who have not a lot of uh, term, like, uh, scientific understanding of ice skates. Um, so they're in a situation where they don't know anything and they want to know something about the topic. So now this is kind of like, um, this is not just one kind of query. There are like other similar questions or queries that look seemingly simple, but have very complex answers. Like, why did the UK leave Europe? If you give me a short answer, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be wrong. Um, or other de topics are developing like pandemics uh, with Zika or COVID, or topics that have like different dimensions that you need to touch on, like the effect of water pollution. And again, the search scenario that we're envisioning is one where the user wants to know a long answer, not just a short yes or no, and not just a very short snippet, but you want the system to be forthcoming with information. All right, to come and inform the user about everything they need to understand the answer without having any further interaction turn. There we go. So typically such users would turn to Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia is great if the answer is there, you win, end of story, but often Wikipedia is not perfect. Um, either there's not enough content or the content is not recent enough or some Wikipedia editor decided that the topic that you care about does not matter to the general public. Uh, at this point, typically people turn to web search. And if you have friends like me then and talk about I why ice skates work, everybody gets their phone out and tries to do some two thumb web search on the fly. and we all know that this is very, very painful. So usually people give up and say, yeah, you know what? Let's order drinks and dinner. The problem here is that users need to manually sift through many web pages. And the first page already contains some information and the next web page contains a few new nuggets. And then at some point you find a web page that has a sort of totally different opinion about it. And we somehow need to mentally collate that kind of information. And I think honestly, in 2021, we should be able to do better we should be able to write a retrieval engine that retrieves results from the web and then write some, maybe some NLP or information extraction algorithm to read these web pages for the user and then collate all the important pieces of information. Just provide like some longer summary of what is going on. When I say summary, I don't just mean a short summary, but like an article that somehow is in the side of Wikipedia. So I think we should be able to train computers to recycle web content to write a comprehensive article in response to a search query, mimicking the style of Wikipedia as one example. The way I think it should work is that the user gives us a query. Now this query becomes this imaginary title of an article and our algorithm is supposed to write the rest. There has been, there's like some connection to natural language generation and there has been a lot of progress lately, but the progress in energy is often focusing on formalized information needs. These are those needs that have a very, very precise question and, that, and for which there will be a very precise answer or short answer. Um, that happens in question answering conversations. Usually your smart speaker makes use of this. 
Um, but if we are talking about these like conscious information needs where the user does not know actually what they really are looking for, there's actually very little information. Of course, you will say, here's an audience favorite, GPT-3, but GPT-3, you can just give it a query, like a prompt, and it will generate the whole Wikipedia article. Yeah, often the problem with GPT-3 is that the text reads nicely, but if you look carefully, it's pretty devoid of real content. And that's something we should be working on. And this is where we really touching at one of the fundamental problems of information retrieval, which is find out which information is relevant to include and then hand it over to like an energy component. And this is like in this case with energy, but I mean, there are also like other external resources such as you know, predefined topics or keyword extraction, knowledge graph, different collections. And they all kind of like culminate on this like one problem. And then we can do maybe some natural language generation on top to make things look a little bit less like a ransom letter. All right. Let me quickly talk three minutes about track complex answer retrieval, which is a track I organized a couple of years ago with fantastic co-organizers. Um, and in track car, we deviated a little bit from my original idea in giving users or like participating systems a query in this kind of like form. It's kind of like a stub or an outline where we have the actual information you need here at the title. And then as a hint to make things a little easier at the beginning, we give the participating systems different facets that we suggest would be covered. And in particular, initially in track, coming with from the idea that we should aspire to represent the style of Wikipedia, we harvested these outlines from Wikipedia articles and then said, please fill in the rest participating systems. So initially, and that can be done as a passage retrieval task uh, and as an entity retrieval task, and in the first two years, we verbalized this as a passage ranking task where for each of these sections, passages were to be retrieved. But it was fairly simple and limiting in that these passages that people could retrieve had to come from a corpus that we produced out of Wikipedia paragraphs after deduplication and so on. And participants could only choose from this particular collection. Not so great, but at least it was something, All right? In year three, we kind of like moved on to really go to more, more like a, let's produce a whole article where users are asked to produce an article consisting of 20 paragraphs. Um, and then we had like manual track assessments who looked at each of these paragraphs said, is this relevant for this query? And if yes, for which of these headings would be like mostly appropriate. But it was still kind of limited in that they had to, participant systems were limited to fill this content with Wikipedia paragraphs as is. There was no way to deviate from that. One other slight deviation that we did in year three is that instead of producing outlines from Wikipedia, we used outlines from textbook chapters written for fifth graders. Um, these ones we got from the TQA collection uh, provided by the AI2, who were originally running a task to train question answering systems. And we shamelessly abused this collection. So the collection has um, a, let's call it like a free text part up here that has a title, different headings, and then some content. It was like really written for like real human children. Um, and at the bottom of each section, there were a couple of exam questions, again, meant to assess human children. Um, with, again, with like a correct answer key that the children didn't have, only the teacher had. So we took this collection and we only, we derived a track card typical outline from it using only the green parts. And the red parts up here, we are holding out uh, and we will use it later and David will tell you more about this. But ultimately this was not really the complex answer retrieval task that I would have liked to work on. I would have liked to work on a task that combines retrieval, arrangement of passages or selection, um, as well as like some language generation or summarization because I want to have a nicely written article. And in particular, I didn't want to be confined to just using paragraphs from Wikipedia. Um, I wanted to use any source collection that I wanted. And if I wanted by my choice, I wanted to use energy systems. And this was like optional. I wanted to actually compare uh, an energy system with like a just retrieval only system, maybe using comparing across different source collections. The problem is, and this is why we never run it, ran it as track, 
um, there are like severe problems regarding evaluating the system, right? I mean, here's sort of like it's all free text. So I know that Alan Voorhees would probably have killed me if I had asked uh, assessors to assess all articles regarding how relevant they are. Um, and in particular, the real problem is like every generated article could be slightly different. And sometimes just changing one word completely inverts the meaning of the whole article or makes it like unintelligible or not really relevant for the original user information need. The other problem is that there are different linguistic styles, especially if you use various source collections. Like there's like the style of Wikipedia, the style of textbook collections, the style of English Wikipedia, and they all can contain the same content, but they just have different style and the style gets in the way of various kinds of assessment measures. So the problem here was we couldn't really use IR me measures for this because they usually assume that corpus is fixed um, and don't really support using the open web, at least not if you want to have one track style reusable collection. Uh, you can use different web collections, but then you have duplicate duplicates in your assessment and it's just like very painful to work with that. Um, also typically they we would assume a fixed granularity of documents or paragraphs or legal spans and there are ways to work around this, but they're just like not a very natural fit anymore. Once you start generating information, it doesn't, it just like crumbles and falls apart. In uh, the summarization literature, um, people usually like to use Rouge, but it's really important to remember that Rouge can only really resolve, resolve near, deep, near deep duplicates. And with near deep duplicates, I mean, in particular, um, create summaries that have to have the same linguistic style as a particular gold summary. So now if my gold summary comes from a textbook collection, but I'm generating an article based on English Wikipedia sources, we will already have a disconnect. And we have some numbers to show in a second that Rouge is really not a good metric for this kind of setup. The other idea is to take the idea of closed tasks and apply them to question answering. And that's something people have done they have uh, taken the gold summary, produced some, derived some questions from it automatically and just checked whether the documents contain the right answers. Now, the problem with this approach, while it's in line with what David's gonna tell you in a minute, is that when you generate a question from a gold summary, you don't know whether you're generating a question that actually matches the information needs or just matches like some side facts that are also mentioned in the gold summary. So this is why I'm personally not a fan of automatic question generation. Instead, um, we think that we could even do away with gold summaries and rather produce a benchmark just of questions. The main thing here is, and that really sort of put my research on hold, is if we can study retrieve and generate systems quantitatively, then we can't really measure progress. So our research would have been meaningless. So this work here is um, kind of like just like one option to, it's maybe not the best option, it's maybe not the final option, but I think it's one candidate where I'm just curious to hear your ideas and concerns about. And that is exam, which is the exam answerability metric. And this is where I will hand over to David who will tell you all about the details of the approach and our study. Hey everyone, I'm gonna quickly share my screen here, see if we can get this working. Is everyone able to see my PowerPoint? I am. Um, all righty. So uh, Laura sort of introduced to you the uh, some of the setup and situation that we're in. I'm gonna talk a little more about exam and how it works, then detail the experience that we did and the results we got. So again, the purpose for us is to be able to evaluate article content from different systems in different locations, not only for the information like relevance, but also comprehensiveness. So if there's some query like Darwin's theory of evolution, we're answering not only the query of what is it, but follow-up questions, perhaps around critics of Darwin or other, uh, other theories at the time, et cetera. So to be able to do this, we decided to use handcrafted or selected questions to evaluate the articles using a QA system. Uh, an example you might see over here 
uh, towards the bottom, an exam question might be something like, Darwin observed that the environment on different Galapagos Islands was correlated with the shell shape of snails, fossils, tortoises, or none of the above. We can use a question like this in concert with a QA system and look for look through an article as the as the input to be able to see can does it contain this information that we want. So if you take the number of questions that the QA system gets correct on those uh, on that particular query, divide that by the total number of questions. You get, a, you get a score, that's our exam score for that particular query. And that's the overall procedure here that you can, that you can see of, we have our retrieve and generate systems, we get articles, put them through a QA system, evaluate them in questions, get scores. So here's like a, a, a slightly more laid out example. You can see here for uh, the performance of these different uh, toy examples of systems and how they perform on the particular query of Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, you can see of these that system two is performing the best based off of the number of questions it's getting answered or the number of questions it can answer correctly. But we're not limited to doing this for just one query. We can do this across multiple different queries. So query one might be around Darwin's theory of evolution. Query two might be about astronomy of planetoids. And we can take all of these different results across the different queries and do a macro average over them to get a system-wide score, which is the overall system exam score. Importantly, we can also do this for gold articles. In our case, gold articles are handwritten articles by humans that are designed to answer all of the questions associated with the query. So if you have the you know, Darwin's theory of evolution, the article should have the answers to all 10 or however many questions there are in the article. By having this exam score for the gold articles, it gives you a upper bound or a relative like maximum that you could expect your systems to perform at. So if you have like a gold articles, like on this slide, getting an exam score of around 0.6, the other systems could be expected to get anywhere between zero and 0.6 for their overall exam score. Uh, the reason you might not be getting like a 1.0 could be down to the individual questions say some of them are written rather obtusely or they ask very difficult multi hop requiring information. So having this gold article set gives you that context to be able to look at your scores and say how are our systems doing overall. Now I've explained uh, briefly about how exam works, but I think it may make more sense once we fill in some of the pieces here and stop talking in general terms. Here's a slightly more filled in version of the diagram you saw earlier, where we've got our Trek car year three participant systems as our retrieve and generate systems uh, based off of the Wikipedia paragraphs. And we take those generated articles and feed them into exam. As Laura mentioned, the queries came from the TQA data set, but along with those, there's textbook chapters associated. Those are our gold articles. And the exam questions correspond to the end of chapter or back of the book questions that are there for students. So we naturally have a set of generated questions, er, uh, excuse me, of generated articles, queries, gold articles, and exam questions. And this is what we used. So paying attention to the left-hand table for a moment, these are the participant systems from Trek Car Year 3 and their performance on exam, uh, Trek Car Year 3's uh, different Cranfield style evaluations of MAP and a baseline of Rouge. In this case, our gold summaries for Rouge were the gold articles, hence not having a gold score, excuse me, a, a Rouge score for the gold articles. If we look at the top five of the uh, of not only the exam ranking, but also the ranking according to MAP, we can see that there's a high amount of overlap where this, they contain four of the same systems, re rank 2 BERT, Dang and TNLP, IRIT Run 2, 
and re-rank three BERT. Uh, important note, uh, the, the names of the systems we chose based off of the names that the, the creators of the systems gave, we use them to be able to distinguish between them here. In addition, the bottom four of both the map and the exam rankings are the same, just in a slightly different order. So you can see visually how, how the rankings are already overlapping. But it goes one step further. This is a table of Spearman's rank correlation between exam, precision at R, map, NDCG at 20, and ruse. Uh, precision at R and NDCG at 20 were other Trek Carrier 3 metrics, though for space constraints, we weren't able to put it in the left table. You can see that exam is correlating really well with the Grandfield style evaluations of map, precision at R, and NDCG at 20 with the rank of 0.74, uh, and Spearman's rank ranges between one and negative one, where one is strong correlation, negative one is strong anti-correlation. We're definitely on the strong correlation side of things. By contrast, Rouge is relatively uncorrelated with not only the Cranfield style evaluations, but exam, which lends some credence to additional credence to exam measuring the same kind of information that these Cranfield style evaluations are measuring. So from these different pieces, we can conclude the following. Uh, first, uh, our exam is able to distinguish between participant system quality. Because of the rankings, we're able to construct you know, a reasonable ranking from top to bottom, and there's like some overlap and alignment between ours and the Cranfield paradigm rankings, which is my second point, that there is this strong overlap based off of our Spearman's rank correlation of 0.74. But stronger than that even is where you can use exam. So you can use exam in some places where you might not be able to use map or NDCG or these other pieces. You might not notice, or excuse me, you might notice that the gold articles don't have a map score or an NDCG at 20. These were pre-written articles by you know, professors, teachers, whoever wrote the TQA textbooks. We can still score those with exam, but scoring these with map or NDCG post hoc might be much more difficult. Or going to natural language generation, as Laura was mentioning earlier, you could evaluate an article from an NLG algorithm this way, because humans are used to create this benchmark of questions that we use a QA system for, rather than evaluating the text or the possible text an article might contain in it. Which brings me lastly to corpus independence. Because we're looking at the content of the text, we're able to look at text that comes from other places that you know weren't in origin like in the first iteration of a study so we're working with wikipedia paragraphs but exam could still work for someone wanting to bring in open text from from the web or bring in content from books or wherever you would want so because of that, we think there is some really solid applications for exam to help with or even generate systems and evaluating them because they'll not only work for the systems and corpi we have now, but the systems and corpi that we'll have later. Um, I think I'm about out of time here, but with that, I'd, I think I'd like to open it up for any questions for either me or Laura. Thank you very much, uh, Laura and David. I can start with two questions and then see what we get from audience. Uh, so I was wondering if you ever tested uh, this evaluation, uh, the exam uh, that you are proposing with different QA systems and see uh, how robust it is uh, to different systems. So we had tested the, oh, <laughs> do you want to go ahead, Laura? Go ahead, go ahead. No, you go first. Um, so uh, I was just going to say the this QA system we used in particular was uh, one from the the same you know from the Allen Institute for AI. We didn't test out uh, multiple QA systems, but that would be one place to expand upon. Laura, did you have uh, any thoughts you wanted to add? Maybe I misunderstood the question. Were you asking about different Q resilience to other QA systems or resilience to other retrieve and generate systems? QA systems, like uh, if 
True. Or yeah. If it's based on the QA system, so the choice of the QA system should be important, right? Right. Well, um, so the idea is, like, I mean, ultimately, if if you would ask me, hey, I want to I want to apply exam to my collection. How should I do this? I would say, okay, you first think about some queries. Then you sit down and you write some exam questions, like multiple choice questions. Um, okay, okay, if you write these multiple choice questions, or there could be principle like any other question answering system, whether it's multiple choice or free text answer, as long as you can verify the answer. Now, it turns out multiple choice is really easy. It's easy to write and it's also easy to verify because you either tick the right box or you tick the wrong box. Um, but in principle, you could use this idea with any QA system that you like. I recommend you use one that is of high quality and you want to verify that it is of high quality. One way to verify that it's of high quality is to actually do that comparison with the gold articles. Maybe David, you can bring up the results slide where you see the exam score for the gold article and you use that as a reference. So you can already see from there at the bottom, like if, you, if your exam score for gold articles is really abysmally low, like 0.002, you know that maybe the questions are in, not in the style that the QA system is designed for, or they are too hard, or they require like some other third party information that maybe is like, or might not be even find, findable on the web or in your corpus. So you have like here at the bottom line, uh, some options to at least diagnose whether something is wrong with your QA system. Yeah, I mean, in general, the, the thing is, um, the, the really expensive part is to, not just to produce a QA system, but like to write a large test collection that then works together with your QA system because your QA system is part of the evaluation metric to so use the same QA system for all different articles from different systems. So that will be fixed and like frozen. Um, so you want to make sure that, that, these, that the set of questions and your QA system can work together and get like a, a decent performance. Um, and I think here in this case, the, the gold article uh, exam score of 0.17 it's actually relatively low. And maybe David can say a few things why the score is so low. Right, I mean, so the, the first piece like here is uh, the, the TQA data set is having a variety of questions that are intended for, you know, these are intended for middle school students to be answering. So, you know, keeping students engaged, it's not about just pure read from the text, find the one span, return it. It's more about having students have this extra thought process and thought provoking question pieces, which can be difficult for some QA systems. Um, but you can have other reasons that uh, the gold articles may not be able to answer some of the questions. Again, some of the questions may be written very oddly, or if there's a lot of like double negations, pieces like that can all have a factor on how the gold articles and consequently your systems perform. Okay, thanks. I mean, you partially also answered my second question, so I just briefly mentioned it. I think also uh, like based on the type of the questions you design and also, again, the QA system that you have, uh, like let's assume in track your, your participants, your submissions would be, could, could be like biased towards the capabilities of this QA system. For instance, if the language, the English language of the generated document is simpler, it might be easier for the QA system to find the answer to the questions or the, the right, language. But Sure, but but like sorry, but such but such an article would probably also be better for your users. Right. Yes. You want to choose a simple language that is easy to understand as possible, but now if you have one question that is very that asks for something very specific, very detailed, if your language is too simple, then you will not be able to answer the other question. That's right. That's right. Thanks. So we have plenty of questions from the audience. Okay, hi. Um, so thank you very much. I found that very interesting. Um, I'm thinking a bit about application of this technology now that it exists, basically. So you designed this to evaluate retrieve and generate systems. But I mean, given the name and given your examples, I'm thinking people could get ideas of employing the same concept and the same scoring way to text that was generated differently. Have you thought about that? So one thing that we that I would really want to do that I didn't get the time the chance to do so is to actually generate articles with GPT-3 and evaluate them with exam. 
might, because at the moment people are very concerned that, oh, we don't know whether the, the stuff actually contains any noticeable content. Maybe it does. And that will be one way to find this out. Yeah, that's actually a good point because there's also going on some discussion about GPT-3 producing text that's like factually incorrect, but sounds good at the first glance. But I'm, as a second point, I'm, I'm thinking about people trying to score human generated text with this. Like this sounds a lot like, you know, essay questions that students could be asked to write. Um, I, I, I haven't thought of this. Um, I usually prefer to evaluate algorithms and I only evaluate the students in my classroom. But, but you're right that, that it could be used. Um, also, you could, you could run another test such as um, if it, um, are like humans able to write a text, like research and write a text that's as good as a fully automatically generated text? All right, I think that would be kind of like an interesting, an interesting idea, but yeah. The thing uh, and by the way, shoot me, shoot me an email with all your questions because I would like to think about these in more detail, maybe have a follow-up discussion. So the reason I ask is because I also prefer to evaluate algorithms and not students, but I think some people, some other people feel very differently about that. And once an idea is out there, it will also be used for things we might not have considered in the first place. So thank you very much for that thought. Hi, Laura. Uh, and uh, David, uh, very cool. Um, I have, I guess, two comments and a question. So first comment uh, with regards to complex questions. Just for clarification, I think that's, that's interesting here. When I talked about complex questions or complex queries, I meant queries that are complex, like in uh, it's a very complicated to express them, and while you are now talking about uh, perhaps simple questions that have complex answers. So I want, just wanted to point this out for confusion purposes. Second thing, I'm so happy that you're working on this. Like I have a colleague working on abstract summarization and he told me a few months ago that they are now using Q&A systems for checking for factual consistencies, something that you talked about. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this. I think it's rather recent, but you might want to check out also the NLP literature on this. But this is a different approach here that you are taking. And now my actual question. So I think, oh. Sorry, uh, so I think one, one thing that I've seen in the NLP literature a lot is all based around automatically generated questions. And I personally think that this is a mistake. I mean, uh, number one, we've been working on this for a while, you know, initially there was no one and then people write papers and now suddenly you're just second in line. Um, but I think the, the, the kind of, you know, the, the, the biggest discussions they have with NLP folks typically is they say, oh, but you already have these summaries and now we also need to write questions. And my suggestion is to ditch the damn summaries because they're pain to write. And then you have these like linguistic difficulties instead of summaries, just write question banks. And they also like, I feel like humans are more naturally attuned to writing exam questions than to writing good summaries. But please, but please mention that email to me, please send me an email and um, point me in the right direction. I think the, the ones that I know also, they generate the questions automatically. That, that's a good thing. I also need to consider this. Uh, well, yeah, so my actual question is, do you think um, it makes really sense to generate an article for the users or like more the conversational way of just giving them a small overview that does not necessarily contain all the answers, but may point them in the direction of what other questions to ask and then give them the answers to something like the Darwin ex expedition, what exactly you will expect them to get. Right, I mean, and this depends on the kind of task that you choose to work on. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that conversational search, uh, so kind of like, you know, with your smart speaker is not a mode that we should be working on. And it's also a mode where maybe you could use something like exam to evaluate every single turn or actually evaluate over a whole set of turns and asking, how many questions could I answer after the first answer? How many uh, after the first turn? How many questions was I able to answer after the second turn? And so on and so forth. And there are, you know, like quiz bowl style challenges of where you get a new clue and a new clue and you should be able to give a better and better answer. Could technically evaluate that one with exam. Um, my personal interest is in really generating an article mostly because, you know, there's a reason why Wikipedia is so widely popular. 
And I don't want to, and especially when I'm in a situation where I really don't know enough about a query to really answer a good question, then it really becomes playing 20, 20 questions with your smart speaker. Like, is it green? Is it red? Um, can I can I can I poke at it and so on? And this is just not a, not a very good user mode in my mind. Um, but of course, like after you get this article, and maybe that article already answers a couple of obvious follow up questions for you. But now you can of course ask, ask more questions, and may, hopefully the system that you're talking to has a better understanding of what this topic actually is about and might be giving you better answers. So minimizing the number of turns until you get until you feel informed would be my optimization criterion. Uh, yeah, I disagree to some extent, but the microphone is kind of getting ripped out of my hand. So let's let's talk about it later. <laughs> you got my email. <laughs> Next question is by Omar. I have to always get back. Thank you uh, for the. Um, interesting setup here and I have, I have a f more of an observation and maybe this was you guys already thought about it or not but this looks like if you want to just abstract from tracks and how about kind of uh, doing a bit of a crowdsourcing plus active learning to generating the queries and also the questions uh, have, you th have you guys thought about this personally I don't like active learning um, I think there are like many, many issues in actually making it work. Um, you could probably do something with like mechanical truckers, but you out of all people should know the pain of working with mechanical truckers best. So I think there are like different ways in which you could generate, you could develop these kind of questions. I mean, track has a couple of like standard ways of doing it. Um, I think David developed a couple of questions for a few of these topics just to see um, how easy is it for a human to actually create some of these questions um, and answers? And I think it's also maybe connecting to maybe track tasks, which is like a conversational switch with multiple turns uh, tasks, where ultimately they also needed like some assessment. At the moment, creating track cast assessment is really painful. And I think this here could be another alternative to just assess whether the answer is contained in that snippet, because that's what we ultimately care about. We don't care about how that snippet is written. We care that it contains relevant information. Yeah, regardless if, I mean, I don't have options, uh, opinions on active learning, but regardless of that, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that if you just think in terms of the framework that you guys have done, if you just augment a little bit more and just open for kind of a human computation in general to kind of like see the questions and, and queries first, just give me stuff and then have a second filter where you say, okay, this is good. These are good queries, good questions, not so good queries, not so good questions. And then you run your thing. That's what I was trying to say. I see. Yeah. And I think certainly the, the benchmark could be developed iteratively, right? And that maybe is also like pointing at active learning. You could, you could create some questions. You take a couple of example systems, you evaluate them. You see, oh, none of these systems actually get anything right. Let me read these and maybe from these answers say, oh, that's a good point. And you just formulate a question around that to, to assess it. And, and you can sort of grow your benchmark. Um, and then, but I think once you have a good benchmark, you can also freeze it and then use it for future systems that might be coming along. Thank you. And if you if you get like feedback from people of like, oh, that, you know, this this clearly is missing X question or Y question, you know, part, part of the challenge for, you know, developing the question could be knowing what to ask. So there's no reason to not get feedback on like, hey, what about a question that covers this piece? Or when I searched this, it didn't cover this aspect that I want. Okay, thanks. Next question is by Arya. So yeah, very interesting. I will think, so Laura just said that, okay, you don't wanna write a summary because that's really hard. But now I need to write all the questions that correspond to what used to be the reference summary, right? So can you shed a bit more light on that process, why it's easier? Um, number one, David tried it and David thought it was easier. Okay. Um, I think, I think what maybe maybe let's maybe let's talk a second about like what makes writing a good reference summary so hard. That is, you write one summary, and now but there might be you could have also written a very different summary in a different linguistic style, and it was sort of like an arbitrary choice. So 
So now technically, if you really want to do the job well, you might need to write many goal summaries. Now this now gets like really difficult and like, and you need to be careful how to choose your words, especially if your goal is to evaluate with something like Rouge or Bird score. Yeah, I mean, I can uh, I could say at least from the process of having generated some of the questions, it's not too hard to generate them, especially because, you know, what you, you, unlike sort of an exam that's like, you know, given to a student, you're trying to write questions that are eminently answerable. So that there's supposed to be things that they do contain. And generally, you want to make it reasonably like you don't want to write not not nots 15, you know, uh, different negations and things. So the questions can be very straightforward, um, you know, with, you know, relatively like simple process of writing them. Okay, thanks. Um, but I also want to make I also want to make clear that that we don't think that exam should be the only metric to like avoid to like evaluate such systems. So I think it's just like one idea to contemplate and to think about and to maybe mess around with the idea, see where its strengths, where its weaknesses. And we were like, we're mostly at the beginning with this. Thank you. I need to close the session. We are